Uh, okay, if there are chat questions in the chat, I will try to. It's gonna be a pop up somewhere. Um, okay, hopefully we will start logarithmically with the difficulties and then eventually end up a little bit no, linear somehow. So I will spend most of the time talking about the background, some background materials on classical integrable system and where the idea of what I study comes from. And I will give you some motivation of why I, what I do, what I study, what I present to you is interesting. Then I will introduce the main character of our talk, which is Diablo Isladic Lattice. I will introduce the generalized Gibbs ensemble, and I will try to explain you how they are connected to the so-called circular beta ensemble. And if you don't know what it is, it's fine. I will explain everything. And then I will give some glimpses of the proof that you can find in uh, my two paper here. Uh, they're pretty like last year paper, so it's fine that you have not read that, but you should, I think. OK. So I'll tell you logarithmically, indeed, we start with classical integral system. And we will consider a Poisson manifold, M, with a Poisson bracket, the classical one, uh, which is not degenerative. And so we have two N coordinates on this manifold, and we can define the Hamiltonian evolution equation in the classical way. So the derivative respect to time of the coordinates is equal to the Poisson bracket between xj and some function of the coordinates h, which is the Hamiltonian of the system. This system is integrable if there exist n quantities which are conserved, so the derivative respect to time is equal to zero, meaning that they Poisson commute with h, and they have to Poisson commute also between themselves and be gradiently independent. At this point, the system is integrable, and this is the definition of the proof of Liouville integrability, somehow. Well, the problem is that usually it's pretty complicated to find those conserved quantities, and so we kind of look for methods in order to produce them automatically. Uh, the best two way, at least up to me, are these two. So finding a lax pair formulation for the system, or to find a Hamiltonian structure for the Poisson bracket. And since we are going to talk about just lax pair, I will just recap you what is a lax pair. Uh, so we say that an Hamiltonian system admits a lax pair formulation if there exist two matrices, L and A, uh, such that the Hamiltonian equation are equivalent to this ODE system for these two matrices. And in this case, L is called the lax matrix of the system and A is the companion matrices. And why this formulation is so powerful? Well, because in this case, the traces of L to the power K for K integer are constant of motion for the system. So we have a way to produce the n conserved quantities immediately. And moreover, this allows us to consider two different sets of independent quantities, which are the traces and the eigenvalue of the matrices. Of course, they are dependent, so we don't have a super integrable model, but just an integral one. Okay, so far I think it's logarithmically going fine. Now, Gibbs measure for this system. I'm interested in the statistical properties of these classical integrable models. And for this reason, we had to introduce a measure. And the classical one is a Gibbs measure, which looks like this for integrable system. Here we have the exponential minus the trace of some potential uh, of, the, of the lax matrix itself times this mu tilde, which is an invariant measure for the system. And you can cook it in any way. One classical example is the Gibbs measure for the harmonic oscillator chain. This one, everybody knows this. I mean, if you have done any course of physics, I guess, or like statistical mechanics, you have seen it at least hundreds of times. And that's it. That's the classical type thing that you can add. And you can have in this exponential also some other conserved quantities related to the harmonic oscillator chain. Uh, and this is exactly this kind of measures. Now, we have a lax matrix, so we have a matrix, we have a measure, and this measure somehow induces a probability distribution on the entries of the lax matrices. And so L becomes a random matrix, okay, nothing fancy, uh, that's what it is. 
but now there are two kind of question that can erase naturally one more on the mathematical side i would say and one more on the physical side and the question are these two the mathematical one if is that one can wonder if l can be reduced to some known random matrix ensemble uh, meaning that uh, it's possible to study the spectrum of these matrices as n goes to infinity give some characterization of the spectrum uh, studying the fluctuation, study the correlation function between the eigenvalues, all this kind of business with, between uh, on random matrices. And on physical side, a question which is related to the talk of Caro also, are the correlation function for this kind of systems. So for instance, SJT is the classical one, so it's the position position correlation. Uh, and we would like to compute this correlation explicitly as n goes to infinity and Actually, what we are interested in much more is the behavior as t goes to infinity. So the decaying properties, the leading order asymptotics. These two questions can be somehow related to each other. Indeed, usually for integrable system, uh, the eigenvalue of the matrices, so the spectrum of the lax matrices, is deeply related to the solution. So the, usually the eigenvalue of the matrices are the building block for the explicit solution and to I mean, makes sense to have an explicit formula and to know how the eigenvalues are distributed if you want to know the statistical properties of this kind of correlation function because you eventually need the explicit solution in order to compute those. Okay, but why we are interested in this correlation function or this kind of properties in general? Well, because they encode transport properties of the system. And I would say something that probably most of you know is that in 1D, there is this kind of fancy phenomenon, which is called anomalous transport, for which we have the, the, the conductivity diverges as uh, the length of the chain goes to infinity. And this is kind of strange, but I think it's even stranger is that they measure this. And this is a picture from Nature Nanotechnology in 2021. And they have this kind of really, really nanotube. And they saw that the conductivity actually diverges as the length of the chain grows. So it's a 1D phenomenon, but is actually happening in real life. So, uh, the problem is that for general dynamical system, I will say classical dynamical system, I have to be precise. Uh, the computation for this kind of correlation function are utterly out of reach. It's not my words, it's Herbert Spohn words, so ipse dixit somehow. Um, mathematical rigorous results are known just for dimension bigger than equal than three. So the, how they decay, how they behave. Uh, and so you want to go to lower dimensions, so one, two, uh, a one and two dimension of how they, how they behave. And so we start with one somehow. There are a lot, a lot of numerical experiments, um, specifically for non integrable models, such as the discrete nonlinear Schrodinger equation, the Fermi Pastaurum system. Whatever you want, they probably already made a paper out of the correlation function, how they behave. And also for nonlinear interval system, they made a lot of those computations for the total lattice and for the average static lattice. So we have an idea how this, okay, how this correlation should behave. And so this should be the, the leading order asymptotics. So a dumping term like one over t to the gamma times a function, uh, which has a kind of zero, uh, so a maximum at zero. And so this correlation would be like a peak moving in one direction or the other, there's a plus of minus here usually. Uh, for nonlinear integrable system, this function is behaved to be universal and should be the Tracy Widom uh, distribution and gamma should be equal to delta equal to two third. And instead for nonlinear interval model, uh, it's believed that gamma should be equal to delta and should be equal to one. So meaning that uh, the correlation scales ballistically and the function is just the Gaussian. Uh, it's not true that we don't know anything about the classical interval system because, of course, we know a lot of things about the short range uh, harmonic chain. 
I don't know why this went down here. Uh, and one can actually describe perfectly how the correlation function for the short range harmonic chain behave. They compute it, they can compute it, we can compute it explicitly and give some uh, asymptotics result for this kind of, uh, so we can explicitly find this function here. And I have, already, I have already to say that usually the behavior is kind of wild. Uh, you will always have an airy peak at the extreme of the chain, but in the middle you can have per C integral and even under uh, kind of even much more complicated stuff. So uh, just these leading asymptotics do not capture all the behavior of the correlation function. We can even go deeper. Okay. So I hope that makes everything a little bit more interesting, all of this. And recently we have a breakthrough in all of these uh, computation in all this business. Uh, okay. Uh, and was made by Herbert uh, Spohn. It was able to characterize the density of states, so the spectrum of the generalized Gibbs ensemble of the Ablovitz of the total lattice, sorry, uh, with polynomial potential in terms of the equilibrium measure of the Gaussian beta ensemble at high temperature. If this last one, two, three, four, five, six word doesn't make any sense for you. It's okay. No, no worries. Uh, I will just mention them because there are some people from random matrix that they know what this means. Uh, I will explain to you later on what, what is not exactly this, but it's kind of broader. And having this characterization, he was able to apply the so-called theory of generalized hydrodynamics and he argued that the decay of correlation function should be ballistic. So delta equal to gamma equal to one, as, is, uh, as it was conjectured by the numerical computation. And as you can see, here are some uh, numerical computation coming from the uh, generalized hydrodynamics made by um, Christian Mendel, which is a, who is a collaborator of Herbert Spohn. And the other correlation function are computed numerically for the total lattice. And you see that they match pretty good. The time is not so long and the chain is 1000 particles. So already at this level, the, the, I mean, they, the agreement is pretty good. He said here the, the error is of order 10 to the minus one, but the peaks are of order three points. So it's not bad. And uh, we think that if time go, grows and grows, they will eventually be one on top of each other. So that's the word of Herbert and also, I told you that this was true for polynomial potential, this relation between the generalized Gibbs ensemble for the total lattice and the Gaussian beta ensemble at high temperature. Uh, Alice Guillonet and Roman Memin uh, generalized this result of Spohn and they obtained a large deviation principle for the empirical measure of the total lattice with continuous potential, implying that this relation between the densities of the Gaussian beta ensemble in and the generalized Gibbs ensemble of the total lattice are uh, odds for continuous potential. So from this recent breakthrough, we arrive to this, which I think is, if you have to remember one thing about this talk, it should be this table. Uh, what does it mean, this table? That on this side, we have this so-called alpha ensemble, which are uh, kind of random matrix ensemble related to the beta ones at high temperature. If that doesn't mean anything for you, it's fine. You have to remember just there is something known on the random matrix side here, well known, well studied, well understood. And on this side, there are integral model, which are less understood on the statistical side, but they are related to this uh, random matrix ensemble. So one can try to understand the behavior, the statistical behavior of this integrable system from the behavior of this uh, random matrix ensemble. In particular, you see the, the Gaussian and the total lattice case uh, introduced by Spohn and uh, uh, Guillaume and Memin. Then the circular one, the circular bit ensemble and the focus in Abwitz Ladic lattice, which is what we're gonna talk about later on. So don't worry, you will understand most of the table out of it. And I want to mention uh, this ongoing work 
which I'm going to relate the Gallagher alpha ensemble with this exponential total lattice, which is another integrable model, and the anti-symmetric Gaussian alpha ensemble with the Volterra lattice. Uh, and it's a work with, uh, in collaboration with uh, Massimo Gisonni, Tamara Grava, and uh, uh, Giorgio Gubbiotti. And the Jacobi case is that was covered by Spohn and by me and uh, uh, Ronan Memin, which is another collaborator of me. Of mine. So this table is important because it like summarizes that random matrices can be related to integrable model and vice versa. So one can try to study these two, these two kind of objects which are kind of far apart using the same kind of math and maybe getting techniques from one side to the other and try to say something about that. Yeah. Okay. So do you expect this sort of correspondence to hold more for like a general integrable system or is there something specific about these systems, any like symmetry constraints, anything? You scooped page 30. Uh, and, no, I hope that, I mean, that's what we know. Uh, okay. And kind of on this side, you have all the classical ensemble of random matrices somehow. And here, and there are much more integrable models on this side. So what I hope is that Usually we go on this direction, so from the random matrices to the integrable model. Maybe there is a way to go all the way around, so from integrable system to obtain some uh, random matrix ensemble which are meaningful with some other, not, not so much constraint or with some mild constraint that you can uh, study them and you can apply technique from that side to study the integrable model afterwards. Okay, but at this point, is there anything you can conjecture that these particular models have in common, you know, that you can see like, oh, these guys, you know, they're going to have this. Or uh, there's nothing like immediately obvious. I mean, I don't know. It's not so obvious uh, somehow. Uh, it's, I mean, I think it's a kind of lack what's happening here. You, you mean somehow you see them say, yeah, this is, uh, I mean, that's what happened for basically all this case, I think. Say so you see that I, yeah, but I read a paper which had the same kind of probability measure on random matrix side and say, yeah, that's it. Uh, probably you can see them about the property of the lax matrices actually for this system here, meaning that uh, the total lattice has a symmetric lax matrices. The focus is with static lattice is a CMV matrices, so unitary matrices. The exponential total lattice is a, a symmetric with with a specific Cholesky decomposition, and the same was true for the Jacobi case. And for the antisymmetric Gaussian and the Volterra, you have an antisymmetric matrices. So you can somehow see that relation at this level. Uh, it's not even that true because, for instance, for Volterra, you have several representations for the Lux matrices that can be not symmetric, they can be also symmetric, and this kind of relation still holds true. So you can kind of intuitively uh, guess the random matrix ensemble from the integrable model, but it's not kind of a perfect machinery. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, so as I said, don't worry if you haven't understood what are these ensemble of random matrices and what are these integrable model. We will focus just on these two now. Okay, so that's kind of really wild introduction. And now we'll go a little bit in details. So what is the Abowitz Ladic lattice? Is this system of ODE, nothing else. And this particle of a J are free to move all over the complex plane in principle. And we will consider periodic boundary conditions. So alpha J plus N is going to be equal to alpha J. This system was introduced by Abelwitz and Ladix in the 73 and and uh, it is an integral discretization of the cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And its integrability was proved by Abelwitz and Ladix actually discretizing the Lux matrix, Lux pair for the uh, NLS uh, from Zakharov and Shabbat. For periodic boundary condition, moreover, we have this 
what's called final gap integration, meaning that we can explicitly write down the solution in terms of spectral variables, which will be the eigenvalues in the first row of the eigenvector of uh, lax matrices. And finally, I want just to point out that not any discretization of an integral model is going to be integrable. Most of you will know it, but it's better to point it out. For instance, the discrete nonlinear Schrodinger equation is another discretization of the NLS, but is not integrable. It has just one more constant of motion, which tells you that this kind of discretization procedure, procedure is not trivial at all, somehow. This system admits a Newtonian structure, and for, indeed, there exists two constants of motion. And you can immediately scoop it. There's kappa zero and kappa one. And since kappa zero is conserved, uh, we can and, uh, and we can consider all the alpha j at time zero to be of modulus less than equal to one. And this would imply immediately that they will stay in the disk forever. Meaning that we can consider dn as our phase space, which is compact. So good, usually. And moreover, on this phase space, we can consider these Poisson bracket from uh, introduced by Ercolani and uh, Lozano. And according, this, according to this Poisson bracket, we can consider, we can find an Hamiltonian formulation of the equation of motion to the lattice in uh, this way. So it's a combination of the log of kappa zero and the real part of uh, kappa one. Uh, I want to point out this kappa zero and kappa one are independent between themselves. So you can actually reduce the flow of uh, kappa zero, of log of kappa zero, and consider just the reduced version of the average static lattice, uh, which has just the, uh, the real part of kappa one as a uh, Hamiltonian. But we're not going to talk about that. So for integrability, I already said, this uh, uh, discretization of the Zakharov Shabbat uh, lax pair, but we're not going to use it. We are going to use it to prove the integrability from Nenchu and Simon uh, that obtain a lax pair for the uh, average static lattice. Otherwise, it would be meaningful, meaningless for me to have talked about lax pairs. So here we have e script dot equal to i e script commutator be between e script and some other matrices a of e script. Just depend on his script. Don't, don't worry how does it look like. And this e script is a really, really precise uh, structure. is equal to the product of L and M. And ah, OK, I wrote it on the opposite way. Fine. And L is uh, these block diagonal matrices, where these psi j are these two by, two by two matrices here, which are unitary. You can see in the determinant is just equal to 1. And this M is almost block diagonal, except these two terms on the uh, on the corner. So let's have a look at the structure of this. Uh, please. Uh, yeah, they are they are exactly related to this, and the integrability also. Uh, you, I mean, the the final gap integration use this property. And uh, this is another kind of, uh, I would say, uh, red flag to, ah, yeah, yeah, this is, there's going to be something about the circular bit ensemble. And you will understand in a minute why. Uh, indeed, this matrix is, is, looks like, like this, and is a, it has a name, so it is important. Uh, and it's called periodic CMV matrix, after the Cantero, Molar, and Velasquez. And the property is that uh, these matrices represent the orthogonal polynomials, the, sorry, the, uh, the orthogonal polynomial on the unit circle in the basis of the product of z, z to 1, z to 2, and 1 over z, 1 over z to 2, 1 z to 3. Uh, of course, it's unitary. Uh, you can, I mean, if you have the, the so this alpha j is also called Verblusky coefficient, if they are periodic, you can always reduce uh, the, I mean, you can always kind of reduce the problem of finding the orthogonal polynomial on the unit circle, uh, studying some property of these matrices here. 
So, and now the probability measure. So the generalized Gibbs ensemble, as I already told you, uh, the trace of power of e script to the L are going to be constants of motion because of the Lux pair. And so I can define the generalized Gibbs ensemble like this. So have the product of one, one minus alpha j squared beta minus one into the power minus the trace of V of e script. Uh, v here is going to be a continuous function from the disk to R. Uh, we are actually interested when uh, V on the torus, so on the boundary of the disk is continuous. That's the only point. And the minus one here comes from the Poisson bracket, so the, from the volume form. Uh, you can kind of say, okay, it doesn't matter this one, I can just absorb it in the beta. But then you have this unpleasant thing that beta can be bigger than minus one, and you don't want it because beta in your mind is always the temperature, so it's always the inverse of the temperature, so it's always positive, so you want to be positive. So I think it's nicer to keep the minus one here. Uh, so we have the generalized Gibbs ensemble. Okay, so that's all for the kind of standard physical side. And then I recall you that now this Gibbs ensemble in the, oh, yeah, please. Uh, v, any continuous function works. Uh, actually, we're gonna prove that for any continuous function, we will have a theorem uh, behind it. Uh, you can think, for instance, V usually is nice if you think about uh, a Lorentz polynomial. So some uh, Z to the K plus one over Z to the K, uh, which on the torus is continuous, which is not exactly what is written here, but is what you need to make everything works. Uh, so this V works, for instance, okay, from one to some uh, capital K. Okay, so this kind of potential works. Uh, the easiest case, of course, when the potential is zero. Yeah, well, okay, you end up with different ensembles, but the name is gonna be all the same. The potential change, but the, the like, how does everything works? Uh, here is driven mostly uh, on the property that these matrices, so this E script, is unitary. So everything is on the torus, and everything is mostly driven if you don't look deeply into the density uh, by just the property that V is continuous. Yeah. Uh, yes. Then the result is going to be a little bit uglier somehow. Uh, in my mind, I always think uh, this kind of temperature here is the right one uh, as the as a special one because this is going to be a special. Uh, this beta here is going to have a special meaning. Otherwise, you can put it everywhere the same beta. Uh, it's fine, but then you have to do a little bit take care of the fact that you are taking exactly the same beta everywhere. Uh, somehow it's better if you say, okay, I put different betas everywhere, and then at the end I set everything equal. In this case, the two limits, it, it's true that they commute. I mean, it's and actually it's the right things to do somehow. Other question? Okay, so as I told you before, this Gibbs ensemble will induce a probability measure on the entries of a script, and the script becomes a random matrices. And what we are going to study is the spectrum of these matrices, and I have to be a little bit more precise now. So we can define the empirical measure as Carol did before. So the deltas. So the, the sum of delta function on, on the eigenvalues of matrix E script. And we want to study the weak limit of UN script as n goes to infinity. And we call this limit it nu beta V, if it exists. And again, I repeat, why I want to study this object? 
because eventually you want to study correlation function and the behavior of the eigenvalue for sure is going to be important if you want to like use the uh, XPD solution because they, they, it uses heavily the eigenvalue of the matrices. So that's why it's important to study those kind of, uh, of this kind of, ob of object. And maybe not even this leading order, but all the terms after it. So the fluctuation or even the correlation of the eigenvalues can be probably handy to study the main problem itself. Okay, now what I think most of you do not know, <laughs> which is the circular bit ensemble. Uh, I have to say, I'm not an expert on these kind of things. I know some of those. I get interested like last year. So uh, if you have some question, I can try to answer, but don't, there are some guys over there that knows better than me. Uh, so. The circular bit ensemble is just the distribution of some particles, theta one to theta n, on the torus, and uh, so not on torus, on yeah, on minus pi to pi, and here we have this uh, van der Man determinant of the e to the i theta, which is nothing like as like these ones, and is exponential of uh, e, uh, minus sum of v e to the i theta j. This V is going to be exactly the same as before, so any continuous function works. Uh, what is the physical interpretation of all of this? Well, if you put this van der Mond on the exponential, then you can think about this like a, uh, some particles on the, on the torus, constrained on the torus, that interact with Coulomb potential, so between all of them. And they are constrained, and they are, and they are also in kind of this field with this potential V. Okay, this is the physical interpretation. I hope that you enjoy this kind of picture. I spent a lot of time doing it with all these colors. Uh, and you always think about this beta tilde as the inverse of the temperature, okay? So again, in principle, you can put it everywhere, uh, but here it's a kind of special, uh, yeah, it's kind of special. Okay, uh, what, what we are interested, in all of this, I mean, you look at this and say, okay, there's no way you can relate this circular bit ensemble with the generalized Gibbs ensemble that I introduced before. There is no van der Mond in the other one. This potential is something totally different. Uh, well, you can do it because there is a matrix representation of this ensemble, meaning that Kilip and Nenchu find, find a random matrices such that the Joint distribution of the eigenvalue exactly this one. So to introduce this, this random matrix, I, I need this definition here. And we said that a random variable x with values in unit disk is theta nu distributed if the expected value of any function uh, are equal to this integral, this integral here. And when nu is equal to one, uh, Theta one is going to be just the uniform distribution on uh, the circle. That's it. Uh, these are geometric, a nice geometric interpretation. If you want this, is not like a totally random picked uh, measure. Indeed, if you consider uh, u distributed uniformly on S nu, when nu is an integer, then u one plus i u two is going to be theta nu distributed. So that's the geometric interpretation of this. Uh, random variable. And now you're going to see something which looks familiar, maybe, if you don't forget everything like in three minutes. Uh, if you consider this alpha j to be theta beta tilde n minus j plus one distributed, this rho j is exactly the same one as before, so the square root of one minus alpha j modulo squared. The psi j are the two times two unitary matrices that I introduced before, and these I have also E0, En are a little bit special. Then I can construct two block diagonal matrices, L and M, and I can construct two CMB matrices now, E equal to L times M and E tilde equal to M times L. Then the eigenvalues of these matrices are exactly distributed like the circular beta ensemble, okay? They have no potential, but it's fine. 
I will, as I will show you immediately. Indeed, okay, that's the structure of the matrices, sorry. Uh, again, it's pentadiagonal, so something like that, is unitary, and is a finite rank and per perturbation of his script. Indeed, for his script, we have just these two corners with, this, with the two elements, and something gonna be different on this part of the matrix, but it's just a finite rank perturbation of the other one. So, so far so good. And now you see that here I have the probability distribution of the sucralbit ensemble just for the eigenvalue of the matrices. And here is that the probability distribution of the alpha J, which is a little bit ugly. Here you have this exponent which diverges in N. It's not that nice, at least up to me. Well, you want to add an extra potential in all of this. It's not hard. Indeed, this part here just become this exponential of the trace of VE. So uh, nothing special. You have a general kind of uh, way to uh, generalize the construction of Kili Penenshu. Of course, now uh, here the alpha J were, sorry, here the alpha J were independent. Here they're not going to be dependent anymore, but it's okay. You, you lose independence to get a fairly more general ensemble to study. So I think it's a good trade off. And this last one looks dramatically similar to the Gibbs ensemble, so generalized Gibbs ensemble of the upper static lattice. Indeed, you see V, E, and E script are kind of the perturbation one of each other. And this term here, okay, this exponent is dramatically different because this one explodes as n goes to infinity, depends on j. Instead, for this one, is all the same. But stay with me for a while, and you will see that they are not so different. So first of all, let's kind of take care of the fact that the exponent of the circular bit ensemble exploding n. And that's easy. Indeed, we can consider just beta tilde to be equal to 2 beta over n which is called the high temperature regime for uh, this ensemble. And basically here you say, okay, now this is bounded and these terms depend mildly on J. Indeed, you can kind of see this. I mean, it helps me to see this as a stair. I mean, I go down the stairs and each steps is one over N. I go down, 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 okay? These random matrix ensemble were studied deeply by a lot of people. And here I will use the result of uh, Ardi and uh, Lambert. And they proved that for beta positive, this beta positive, and V, any continuous function from the torus to R, then the empirical measure satisfy what is a large deviation principle. Fine if you don't know it, but it means that this measure here weakly converge to some probability distribution, mu beta v. And mu beta v is the unique minimizer of this functional. If you remember, it's basically the same things as Carol introduced for me before. There's a functional, you want to minimize it, and you find, yeah, okay, I have a measure. That's the, the same kind of uh, idea behind it. Okay, so now a little recap. Here we had the generalized Gibbs ensemble of the average static lattice. Here, the probability distribution of the circular bit ensemble at high temperature. So these terms is uh, these stairs. And for this ensemble, I know that we have this convergence. And mu beta v is uniquely characterized. So these two looks so close to each other that there is just one and only one question that you can ask yourself, and it's the following, is that can I recover the density of states of the abrovitz ladic lattice in terms of the one of the uh, circular bit ensemble at high temperature? I mean, the only difference is that in exponent, I have on one side these stairs, 
And on the other side, this line. So here I have stairs of beta, and here instead beta is constant. So here I go down, two, 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 instead here, all the same slope somehow. Which, I mean, if I kind of do something like this, maybe you can start to think about an idea, right? Like integration, something like that, this kind of procedure. And that's more or less what's going to happen. Indeed, this is the result. The first result we uh, obtained with Tamara Grava, and we proved that for beta positive and <clears throat> any, any Lorentz polynomial V, then the density of states of Biabwitz ladic lattice can be computed explicitly as these weird derivatives. So the derivative respect to beta of beta times mu beta V. And mu beta V is the density of states of the circular bit ensemble at high temperature, which is the, just the minimizer of this functional. Uh, I have to say also the spawning dependently obtained the same result, meaning that he point out that the proof that we get would work. Say, okay, this is, uh, the, the technique should be this, and the result should be this one. Say, so, yeah, and he exactly got it. And the second one uh, is my result with Rona Memin, and it's the same as before. The only thing is that now the potential V is continuous and bounded. So basically, this one is the brother of the result of Herbert for the total lattice. So he had polynomial, we have a Laurent polynomial. Uh, instead, this one is the brother of the result of Ellis, Guillonet, and Ronan, which is the same guy here uh, for the uh, circular bit and sum, so for the Abrit static lattice. Okay, now if you stay with me a bit longer, <laughs> I will try to explain to you like some glimpses of the proof, because of course the theorem is basically the same, the proof, they do not match at all. Uh, indeed, with Tamara we use the transfer operator technique and combined with the moment method, and we proved also some other result in the paper. And with Ronan, instead, we prove a result using the large deviation principle technique, and we make use of some ideas and theorems coming from the uh, previous result, of course. Uh, I think I would try to spend a bit more time maybe on the proof with Tamara, because I think most of you are familiar with this kind of thing, so it can be more I mean, you can bring much, much more at home. The first thing to do is to define the free energies for the average lattice and the circular bit ensemble. Classical way, so one over n, the log of the partition function. Okay, and now the really, really technical part is this one. Uh, that the energy, the free energy of the Abelian static lattice is nothing but the derivative respect to beta of beta times the free energy of the circular bit ensemble. It's a kind of magic. Uh, why this should be true? Well, think about the easiest case possible. So, no potential, everything independent. I can compute everything. Uh, and these are the two partition functions, indeed. So now you compute the free energies, and you see that on this side we have, you have this integral, and on this side you have this log of beta over pi, which is exactly this relation here for the potential equal to zero. Okay? And now somehow you say, okay, uh, I mean, at least for me, it was clear that at this point that you really need to use the transfer operator because what you want to do is actually to prove that when the potential is different from zero, you can still write these uh, two uh, partition function as one as the product of some a function of beta 
evaluated beta times one minus j over n. And this one is a product of the same function from j from one to n. So it's somehow saying that the contribution is equal from each side for the average sladic lattice. Instead, since the exponent of the beta is changing a little bit on the way, uh, the one from the uh, circular bit ensemble is changing mildly in J. And if you prove this, then the result is kind of obvious. Okay? It, I mean, if F is continuous, then on this side, you will exactly get this kind of integral with uh, f in place or f of beta x in place of the log of beta x over pi. And instead, here you get exactly the log of f of b. So here's the log of f, of course. And the way to generalize it is to prove that you can use this uh, transfer operator technique. OK, and after that, uh, there is the kind of trick, this moment trick, that you can compute the moments of these two density of states, starting from the free energy. And this, again, is not simple, this equality, meaning that you have to swap limits. And when you swap limits, is always a pain. Uh, indeed, we are able to prove this relation just when uh, V is a polynomial, otherwise, uh, it's not true anymore. But you can compute the moments, and the moments, in this case, characterize uniquely the measure, the density of states. And having this relation on the moments, which basically you can prove it from this relation here, from this moment relation, well, you have this relation for the, uh, for the densities. Somehow clear? Any kind of weird question about this? I hope not, but OK. Um, finally, some like one slide about this uh, with the proof with Ronan. And we use a, really a random matrix technique. So uh, something coming from the realm of probability. And uh, we prove a large deviation principle for the family of the empirical measures, um, which implies this weak convergence uh, here. And nu beta v is characterized as the unique minimizer of this functional here, which is not explicit even in the paper. It's not ex an explicit functional. But what is nice is that we can rewrite the functional of Lambert and Hardy in this fancy way, but kind of try to forget this limb of delta going to zero, this limb in first q goes to infinity, and just take the limb as q goes to infinity and think about this new uh, i beta q to be continuous function of this parameter. Well, this one is basically the integral of this thing somehow. OK, so you have a, all these increments. So it is a, it's a Riemann sum, basically, of this kind of integral. So here you got an integral, and here you got the functional. And this kind of strange things implies this relation on the left, which is basically this one up to weak convergence, of course. So that's the way to prove the, the, the two results. The really brief, I'll just say to you, just shout at you some words probably, but I hope something will stuck in your mind. Uh, uh, okay, now this new beta v is unique, is uniquely characterized. This mu beta v is unique, uniquely characterized. Yeah, but how do they look like? I mean, something is nice, this result, but somehow you want to also to see, uh, look at this measure. And Ardi Lambert proved that the density of states of the circular bit ensemble when the potential is zero is just the uniform distribution of the circle. And applying our result, immediately we get that this holds true also for the Abruzzi sladic lattice. With Tamara, instead, we consider the classical Gibbs ensemble also for the uh, Abruzzi sladic lattice, which amounts just to take uh, the potential to be equal to nu 
real part of z. And we can explicitly compute the density of states of the circular orbit ensemble of the and of the Abrid static lattice as a function of v of z, where this v of z is the unique analytic solution at zero of this double Conventoin equation. And lambda is determined as unique solution of a transcendental equation. And you will say, how the hell is this more explicit than before? Well, because you got an explicit recurrence relation for the coefficient of uh, v of z nearby zero. And this convergence is pretty fast, it's exponentially fast. So you can plug it into a computer and the computer will give you the answer at any precision you want. So you can plot this function and see them. Okay, so that's, I think more or less everything I want to say. Well, just to finish telling you about two things. The first one is that the explicit computation of the correlation function is still out of reach. And despite we have several insights from the generalized hydrodynamics, from the uh, finite gap solution integration, the explicit solution are still out of reach, at least for me. Uh, and that's something for like the physical audience somehow to think about maybe and to get puzzled. Instead, I have something for the random matrix guys also in the room, uh, which is related to the question they had before, which is that usually in all this business, we are going from the uh, random matrix side to the integrable systems. So we use the knowledge of the random matrices to get something from the integrable model. Maybe possible to go the way around, because for instance, we have other integrable system and here I just mentioned the focusing algorithm static lattice and the focusing modified KDV equation that maybe can lead to some 2D bit ensemble at high temperature that can be studied and can be of some interest for the random matrix community. That's everything I want to say. Thank you for the attention. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Do you know, if, uh, does this work? I hear you. Uh, so. Do you know, uh, for example, new is a bit hard to compute, but can you say anything qualita qualita qualitative about new? Like, uh, is the support a full circle? Is it an arc of a circle? Does it depend on V? Uh, does it depend on, is there a phase transition for yeah, simple yeah, yeah, Vs, okay. et cetera, et cetera? <laughs> yeah, and to this, okay. This is stopped working, of course. And also my computer stuff, okay. Uh, Let's go back here. It's okay. This one, which is nice, I think. Uh, okay. There should be something. You should be able to say this. And I'm telling you this from some insight from the uh, circular uh, ensemble, actually. Because on the circular ensemble, you have some specific transition when uh, this beta is bigger or smaller than some values, uh, you get that the, the, the measure is not supported on all the circle or just some arc, and you can explicitly compute those arc at least. And so I think that it should also also for the uh, average static lattice. I don't know how to translate it because what I'm telling you is not in the high temperature case, it's just for the case with uh, beta tilde fixed. And when beta tilde fix is fixed, uh, the functional changes drastically, uh, meaning that these terms disappear. And so I don't know if the disappearing of that terms uh, makes the appearance of this kind of behavior where uh, the support is not uh, on the whole circle, but just on some portion or some arc from some specific value of beta tilde. And if this term maybe is there, 
is kind of a smoothing effect, meaning that the support gonna be all uh, all the circle all the time for any kind of potential. That's I don't know, but it's possible that there is kind of all this kind of phase transition. Again, I'm not a big expert of these kind of things, but that's what I understood at least. Sorry, maybe I didn't understand well. You you say that uh, two terms were going away in the regime you are studying, right? You are a kind of large beta limit. Uh, depends on which side you look at it. I mean, if you look at from the average static perspective, yes, the circular bit ensemble is. Uh, low temp a low temperature limit. That is a large beta limit. Large beta limit, yes. yeah. If you look in the other way around, the, from the circular beta perspective to the abelic static lattice is a high temperature limit, so beta going to zero. Uh, do, 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 do. Because of the n, because of this factor n, you mean? Yeah, because this factor n. Okay, okay. Because here, for instance, we have this factor n in front of everything, and in order to obtain the abwitz ladic lattice, you have to fix this beta tilde to be equal to two beta over n. So your temperature, which is beta tilde for the circular ensemble, is going to zero. So you are always in the high temperature. Yeah, in this case, yeah. Ah, yeah, okay, 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 okay. I misunderstood your question then here, okay. okay. Other questions? Okay.